Chris Ballerino from the New York State Coalition of Sexual Abuse. Good Hi afternoon. There. Thank you for being My here. My name is Chris Ballerino. I'm with the New York right State yep. Coalition Against Sexual Assault. First, I want to convey my condolences to the Stewarts. I can't imagine, I have one child, she's 30, and she's my life, she's my precious one, and I just want to convey my deepest condolences to the family. I appreciated their comments. I, Christine Ballerano, familiarly known as Chris, am giving this testimony today from a place of respect, compassion, and deep empathy with people who've experienced interpersonal violence and, their, and other traumatic forms of crime. As an advocate in the sexual assault movement for over 20 years, over 19 of those serving as statewide project director at the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, Ms. Casa, I've learned a great deal about the criminal justice system's approach to managing victims of crime and those who have done harm and violated the rights of survivors. As a statewide sexual assault and mental health project director since 1999, I've heard countless testimonies from survivors for whom the criminal justice system brought no justice. Survivors from whom much was taken and not restored or witnessed in any manner that brought healing for the traumatic injury that was caused. And I'd like to share this statement from our organization's project team, which I shared earlier in our press conference. Too often, the actions public officials take in the name of crime victims, particularly in the name of survivors of sexual and domestic violence, do not line up with the actual needs and desires of the majority of survivors, especially survivors from communities that are at most risk. Most at risk. As an organization committed to healing and justice for all survivors and to truly ending sexual violence, NISCASA recognizes that reliance on a biased and inherently reactive criminal justice system will not achieve these goals. Like many survivors, we would rather see public officials take action to ensure that survivors, their families, and communities have the comprehensive resources they need to heal and to thrive. That significant investments are made in community services and institutions that will prevent violence from happening in the first place that people who commit harm are held accountable in a meaningful way that does not perpetuate a cycle of violence, and that people who commit harm have access to the services they need to stop committing harm. As a survivor of sexual child abuse, by my paternal grandfather, a rape as an adolescent by a boyfriend I trusted, and sexual assault as a college freshman by a teacher my first semester in college at Stony Brook University. I know firsthand how these crimes go unspoken, unhealed, and ultimately made invisible. So you see this issue is personal for me. And I understand what my colleagues and other sur survivors refer to as a rape culture. We continue to have powerful institutions that protect adults who harm kids and even punish youth for the actions of adults. Although I know of efforts being made in some areas of service provision to be more trauma-informed, there is still a lack of cultural competence and far too great a propensity toward punishment and different forms of violence when a person is seen as non-compliant. Locally, we all saw the tragic results of reactivity in the heartbreaking case of Dante Ivey. We see this violence play out in victim-blaming scenarios where bullying, Blaming and harassment run rampant, with people savagely disrespecting other people. At times, this violence is even labeled as appropriate behavior by institutions set to maintain the status quo. As a child, I didn't tell anybody about my sexual abuse because I didn't feel I had the power to speak up against my elder. What I do remember doing, though, again and again, was run to another elder, my maternal step-grandfather, James Rearer, who I trusted implicitly and who loved me unconditionally. His love and protection of my spirit was one of the greatest assets of my childhood development. Grandpa Rearer was also an ex-felon from before I was born, having as a minor driven the getaway car for his older brother's failed bank robbery in Ohio. I didn't know this fact about him until years later after he had passed away. 
He had been offered an out from prison by serving in the military during World War II, and I knew he had served. He was always a man of great dignity and love for others. My mother's older sister, my Aunt Fran, described my grandpa as a knight in shining armor when I asked her about my biological grandfather, who I had never met. She told me about my grandfather's courtship of my grandmother and how, as an uneducated Sicilian immigrant, my maternal grandmother had endured domestic violence in her first marriage and had relied upon nuns to help raise her three young daughters, my mother included, during the Depression, living in extreme poverty before marrying my grandpa, Rira. I recall grandpa earning a good living as a union laborer and how be beloved he was by his coworkers, his friends, and all of his family. After coming home from school as a child, I would run to his and my grandmother's house behind our home on Long Island to be with him in the garden or watch him work in his garage or just run errands together in his pickup truck for my family. He was my gentle giant protector and I loved him with all my heart. He was a complete contradiction from the other grandfather who was in my life at the same time. They both lived within walking distance from my home. He was my, his elder brother, my uncle John, was also very special to me and taught me how to fish as a young girl, treating me as a real person not just as a little girl, giving me confidence in myself at a time when I was most vulnerable. I had the, re the highest respect for these two men. I had no idea that they had each been convict convicted of felony crimes as young men. They remain in my heart and my memory among my dearest mentors. And I cherish stories and photos that remain of them. I would hate to see us moving backward and prejudging people for eternity based upon their actions as youth. Taking away an individual's right to vote is another way of dehumanizing the most marginalized citizens of our nation, and as such, it's another form of violence. Such policy has no place in New York State. We should proudly model human rights, not exacerbate systemic oppression. Instead, our policy should foster self-respect, healing, empathy, and prepare incarcerated individuals to participate as citizens on the outside, not discard and disregard people as unworthy of dignity and civil rights. If Nelson Mandela can lead a truth and reconciliation tribunal in post-South Africa, I mean, in post-apartheid South Africa, after suffering decades of brutal imprisonment, what stops us from honoring human rights for all people in the United States? We also know that too many people living behind bars are themselves victims of violence, trauma, tremendous loss as children, adolescents, and adults. Many are there for nonviolent crimes that were survival strategi strategies, the most accessible ways of coping with the traumatic pain that they'd experienced as victims. These young people, like some of us in this room, may have used self-destructive behaviors like drugs, like alcohol, to get by, to survive resulting in these survivors being criminalized for their coping strategies. We also know that those who, were serve, who serve the longest and harshest sentences for these offenses are the poor and disproportionately people of color. Those early traumas known as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are often exacerbated by the brutality experienced and witnessed while in prison. And the racism and implicit bias expressed in mainstream culture throughout so many of our institutionalized systems, including our healthcare system. I have visited incarcerated survivors and I know from what I've seen how broken this system of mass incarceration is from families and individuals seeking healing and or justice. I recall visiting with a female survivor of domestic and sexual violence in Columbia, Columbia County's jail in Hudson while I was working as a rape crisis counselor at the REACH Center of Green and Columbia Counties in the 90s. She refused to allow me to tell her family she was in jail because she didn't want them to see her that way. The shame she felt about them seeing her behind bars was too great for her to ask for support that she desperately needed. And as a crime victim, the subsequent isolation did nothing to help her heal from her trauma. Her crime had been a relapse of cocaine use while she was on parole. Again, self-medicating because she'd been raped. I could go on about special housing units for survivors, 
of sexual assault while in custody and how this practice is the equivalent of torture. But I'll stop here because I'm about out of time. I would like to thank you for listening to my testimony and Ms. Goss's request to recognize the right to vote as a human right, that all people be counted as a human member of our troubled society, a society in great need of healing and restorative practices across all of our human service institutions. This criminal justice system being just one, anyone working with people needs to think of them, think of, needs to think of themselves as human services or we endanger others by perpetuating pain and trauma instead of providing some form of corrections, restoration, and healing, which we state is our intention. Increasing parole rates and granting voting rights are positive steps in that direction. Attached to my testimony, you will see the new vision for crime victims that the Downstate Coalition drafted last year and that Ms. Gassa wholeheartedly supports as well. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as a panel or as individuals. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. And um, thanks for sharing your story and turning it into something, uh, working over your career now to help other people. That, that's really, I'm fortunate I didn't have to experience that, but thank you for standing up. Appreciate that. Now I have a couple questions. Um, you've touched on many things, many of the challenges that we and our colleagues face in both, um, well, not just both, in many areas. You mentioned health care, uh, social related services, criminal justice, and many other things, much greater than the scope of today. So I want to bring it back and ask about uh, the victim impact panels. Have you had any experience, not panels, the victim impact meetings? Statements. Have you had any, yes. Have yes, you had I any helped. experience in dealing with victims? Yes, I, I worked in direct services before I came to the coalition, and I assisted victims in drafting their victim impact and, and statements and making sure they knew how to go about the process and also helping them with the application for crime, what used, used to be called crime victims' compensation. Is that valuable to victims? Absolutely. That process? It is valuable. Is it adequate? I don't think it is adequate, no. How could it be better? Well, I'm a strong believer in restorative practices. <coughs> I really do believe that that's where we're moving as a culture very slowly at, at, the, at the rate of a glacier, perhaps. But I know in the college sexual assault area in particular, which is one of the projects I supervise at Nascasa, and, it, and because I was violated when I was in college, it was a, I was actually heading that program before we hired Michelle Carroll, our project director. She's been um, trained in restorative justice practices, and she's actually been working with the New York State Department of Health to help them better understand how restorative practices and restorative justice models can be utilized in a campus setting. Because in oft often, so many cases, survivors really want that more relational model. They want to be able to not necessarily um, have the person who did harm toward them incarcerated, but they want them to understand that what they did was wrong, that what they did was violence. And unfortunately, the way the system operates currently or has been operating up until now, I mean, enough is enough is making some changes for sure, but it's not enough. <laughs> I know that's what the law is called, enough is enough, but it's not enough. <laughs> and so there's we a actually, lot. I think many, you'll find many people up here agree with that. Yeah, so there's a lot more that can be done, and I don't think we should wait till college either. I think that we're, we're seeing more and more issues of children. I myself experienced this child sexual abuse at eight years old. I know people who've experienced it at much younger years and, and older years. And so it's like we can't wait till college to be dealing with victim impact statements. We can't wait till someone's dead or raped before we're helping the family. You know, we should be doing much more preventive measures, which is one of the things my coalition really stands, our coalition really stands for, is primary prevention, really stopping the violence before it happens. And yeah, so victim impact statements are important, but they're no solution. There's so much more that can be done. And I think that it really begins in a, in, in a cultural competency and a, in a understanding what rape culture is and also what racism is and what, what 
you know, violence against women is rooted in as well. Right? Violence against anybody who's held in less power. And the power differentials that we see in this country. I think that's where, that's where the crux of the, of the matter really is. When you have somebody who feels powerless, how are they going to gain power? Senator Eksher has some questions. Do you believe that criminal justice reform is appropriate? Do I feel that, do I believe that criminal justice, justice reform, reform? Yeah, it's appropriate. Yeah. Bail reform is appropriate? Bail? Bail reform is yes. appropriate? Uh, parole reform is appropriate? Yes. Do you believe it's appropriate to allow violent sex offenders into schools to vote? I don't believe that violent sex offenders um, ought to be in schools where children are unsupervised while they're voting, but I also want to tell you that those who've been convicted of sex offenses are a drop in the bucket compared to the numbers of people out walking around un unprosecuted, that most sexual assault crimes have not been reported to law enforcement. 80% yeah, of, of, right, of them have not been. The purpose of this hearing, though, is to determine should we be reforming the parole system and then to talk specifically about uh, the voting rights of, of some. Correct. Um, my question to you was, do you, do you think it's appropriate uh, to have violent sex offenders voting within the confines uh, of a school? Or perhaps, is there a better system that we could put in place? I think there's place? probably all kinds of better systems we can put in place. Okay, thank you. I think we're done with questions, but you mentioned right at the very end of your testimony that you had an attachment, and I don't. I, don't I did know that attach we have it. That. I, I it? paper clipped a, a two-page document to my one-page testimony, so everyone should have received that, unless unless somebody dis, disattached them. Do you have a copy with you? Unfortunately, I handed them all to the woman that was sitting. Okay, in we the will. Back. It's, it's the new vision for crime victims, we, and it was written by the Downstate Coalition. We will track that. We'll connect with you, if not immediately following, but to get that. Because I don't, never mind, located. All right. You found I, it? Yes, thank Great. you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you,